big part of creativity is using stuff in ways it was never intended to be used. You could call it hacking. You can hack tools, objects, working methods, concepts, ideas, often ending up fundamentally rethinking how something works or what it actually is. Take, for example, the musical element of rhythm. If I asked my classical music friends who's the most creative rhythmic innovator of recent times, some might talk about Steve Reich for the way he hacked into African polyrhythms and used them to build the foundations of what we now call minimalism. Some might say somebody like Thomas Addis for the way he hacked time signatures, using them in ways that they were never really intended, with time signatures like 4-6. Others might suggest Conlon Nancaro for the way he hacked the famously bourgeois instrument of the player piano and used it to create devilishly fast and complex rhythms. But I want to offer up a new candidate for the list, and that name is James DeWitt Yancey, better known as Jay Diller. Diller was a hip-hop producer and beatmaker from Detroit who had a very short career and no mainstream hits under his own name before his untimely death in 2006 from a rare blood disease. For those who know him, he's revered for his famously wonky or out-of-kilter or drunk-sounding rhythms. But I think he deserves credit for hacking not just the drum machine, but the very fundamentals of musical rhythm itself. His approach has had an enormous effect on drummers and producers who've had to find ways to hack their own playing and creating to absorb Diller's influence. And I think it's high time us classical musicians took note. In this video, I'll talk you through the techniques themselves, the fascinating ways performers have struggled to recreate some of Diller's rhythms when playing live. Oops, I got it wrong. And finally, my own attempts to hack the hacker, as it were, and find ways to use these rhythms in ways they were never intended in my own classical compositions. All music begins with the second event. That's what Dan Charnas says in his fantastic book on Dilla called Dilla Time. Hit a drum once and you have a single note in space, but hit it again and you've started a process of expectation and anticipation that forms the heart of music making. You've suggested or implied an underlying pulse. Once the pulse is established, there's a further implication, which is the subdivision of the pulse, a kind of grid of possibilities within the pulse. It's kind of strange that this level of music doesn't really have a name. Subdivision is sort of what it does rather than what it is, but there are various ways to subdivide up a pulse. We're used to subdivisions of three or four, but there's no reason they can't be five or seven. Some music allows the grid a lot of flexibility, so the speed of those subdivisions fluctuates. In classical music, this is known as rubato. Other kinds of music stretch the pulse into longer and shorter units, like the swing in jazz. In some music, most of the notes of the grid are sounded out, but in a lot of music, they're only implied. The rhythm of a piece often emerges by selecting patterns that run over the top of that silent background grid. But in pretty much all music before Diller, the underlying assumption is that all players playing together are using the same underlying subdivision, the same grid. If everyone's swinging, they're all swinging together. I think it's fair to say that most of us always took this silent grid for granted. We never paid much attention to it, which is probably why it doesn't have a name. We always just assumed that was the way music had to be, because without it, surely musicians wouldn't be able to synchronise and the music would just fall apart. Well, that was exactly the assumption that Diller was about to tear down. The career of Diller is inextricably tied with the career of drum machine maker Roger Lynn. Lynn's first machine, the LM1, was the first to use real drum samples, and it was a big hit most famously with Prince, who used it prominently on a number of tracks. But it included one feature which not many of those early adopters paid much attention to, presumably because of its weird label, Adj 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 shuffle. Shuffle. It's referring, of course, to adjusting the shuffle, something I would describe as the swing ratio. Anyone not familiar with the nuances of jazz will tend to think of swing as this rhythm. <laughs> 
a long note and a short note in a ratio of 2 to 1 or 66%. But in jazz performance the ratio used typically varies greatly depending on the feel. I actually did a whole video about this a few years ago. Lin was musically savvy enough to understand this, but I guess he brought his engineer's mind to the subject as well, and was the first to quantify these subtle differences. His drum machine offered six different swing ratios, so if this is the standard swing of 66%, this is around 60, and this is around 54. So as I said, most early users of drum machines ignored this feature, either because they didn't understand the button, or because shuffle and swing just seemed a bit old-fashioned amidst the hard, straight-ahead beats of the 80s. But using Lin's later machine, the MPC-3000, Dilla became one of the first to adjust the shuffle, somewhere no one had thought to use it before, in hip-hop. Hip-hop? Hip-hop! This is from one of Dilla's early beat tapes. Making beats for other artists was Dilla's main form of creation. Just for a second, let me explain for those of you not familiar with hip hop or modern R&B. A beat here is not a music theory term, but refers to the instrumental or rhythmic backbone of a track as distinct from a full song. A beat usually consists of a combination of drum patterns, bass lines, and maybe some harmonic elements, but without the inclusion of vocals or lyrics. The beat serves as a foundation over which artists rap or sing. But nevertheless, it can get a little confusing sometimes, so here are the main beats of this beat. A straight hi-hat would fall here, but you can just about see it falls one line later, or about a sixteenth of a beat, which makes this a swing ratio of about 56 percent. Another way you could achieve this effect on the MPC-3000 was by note shifting. The machine gave you the ability to nudge individual notes by microscopic amounts forwards or backwards. Do you mind? This was again a feature that went almost untouched for several years after the launch of the machine, until Dilla arrived. I suspect it was mainly put there by Lin to allow people to correct notes that they'd manually inputted, but no one had thought to use it as a creative tool. And Dilla applied this shift effect not just to the swing, but to other aspects of the beat. Here's a standard hip hop beat with the kick on the one and the snare on the three. The most common form of shifting Dilla used was to move the snare hit slightly early. The specific amount varied from track to track, and it's interesting to compare the feel. Here the snare is about a sixteenth of a beat, or a sixty-fourth note, early. And in this beat for Slum Village's 2U4U, it's an even shorter triplet 64th note. It's worth acknowledging that these are minuscule differences and it can be difficult to pick them out. These are rhythms that are felt more than they are heard directly. Even if you can't consciously hear that the beat is early, you can probably sense something about the feel, that it's laid back, cool, or just has some slight attitude that you can't quite put your finger on. Shifting individual items like this didn't just apply to the drums, it could be applied to other elements of the beat, like the keys or the bass. Listen here to how the bass drags behind the beat. You can particularly hear it in this last section. Or listen to the keyboard chords here, which sometimes come just before the beat, and sometimes just after. And one of Dilla's great inventions was to apply this shift consistently to one entire element, for example shifting the entire hi-hat pattern. This example from the posthumous Motor City album is particularly interesting. The cello here is shifted a 30 second note relative to the drums. Now if I was trying to notate this beat for real instruments it would look something like this. And if you gave that to a cellist to perform, I think they'd probably laugh in your face. But before we get into more about recreating these kind of rhythms with live players, 
We need to get to some of the most radical dismantling of that unified subdivision grid. We've talked about changes to the swing ratio and about different ways of shifting an element of the grid, but an unexpected and frankly unrequested feature of the MPC was that you could adjust swing ratios on different parts of the same beat. I doubt very much whether Lynn considered the musical implications of making simultaneous independent swing ratios a possibility, because as we've seen on his machines, even adding the shuffle on a global level was a relatively underused feature. Instead, I think this was one of those creative hacks. Dilly used a quirk of the system and turned it into a creative feature. For example, check out this keyboard chord which is on a swung offbeat. Played by itself like that, it reminds me a little bit of Michael Jackson's The Way You Make Me Feel. But then let's add on Dilla's drums. The result is a shocking clash between the straight drums and the swing syncopation on the keyboard. Swung keyboard. Straight drums. And now both together. In the next example, we have something around a 57% swing in the hi-hats. Against a triplet or sextuplet swing on the guitar. So it's kind of a 6 against 7. Again, all very subtle stuff, and obviously I'm not saying that Dilla thought in terms of 6 against 7, that's just the feel he went for. And having that 6 against 7 is crucial in giving the track that unique Dilla feel. For the final Dilla technique, I'm going to use an example by Dilla's friend and collaborator, the producer Karim Riggins, on a track by Erika Badu. So although it's not Dilla's production, it's very much in his style and just a really clear example. I tried to use a clip of the original, but the video kept getting blocked, so I had to recreate it here. This time the track mixes quintuplet swing with straight shifted notes, and I'm grateful to Slink for figuring this one out. I've linked his video below. Basically, imagine a quintuplet groove in the drums and then a straight groove in the keys over the top. Now shift that straight groove slightly to the right. In fact, shift it just enough so that every other note actually lines up with the second note of the quintuplet groove. So the keys are now late on the downbeat, but synced up with the wonky part of the swing in the drums. Again, the notation version seems mad. Halfway through a quintuplet means it's here. But with an understanding of what's happening, I think it is possible that somebody could play this back live. And again, we'll look more at playing these kind of rhythms in just a second. But before that, let's just summarize what we've got so far. So where we used to have a unified underlying grid, we now have elements that are straight, elements that are swung, different kinds of swing ratio playing together, and elements that are shifted. And sometimes all of these different things are all at once. So our unified grid has become quite definitely wonky. And this is what I mean by Dilla's frankly revolutionary approach to that underlying nameless grid. Three, four. So are these kind of beats reproducible on live drums? Oops, I got it wrong. To a large degree, the surprising answer is yes. The first to really study and attempt to emulate them was Questlove, shown here shifting the downbeats behind the beat. And he's been followed by a whole range of drummers from Anderson Pack to Chris Dave to JD Beck to Nate Smith and many more. There seems to be two groups of thought when it comes to recreating swing ratios on live drums. Jazz performers naturally varied the swing ratio based on feel alone, and there's a large group of players who swear by feel as the only way to pick up these rhythms. For me it's just about like approaching it in the same way that the producers who made this music approached it, and that was not to sit down and 
talk about subdivisions. If you're talking about Detroit hip hop, it's not about, oh, it's a 30 second triplet or a quintuplet or well, you're just not coming at it like that. Yeah. It's just about feel. And it's actually about something that you can't write down. You can't notate this. It, it doesn't work. You can't do it. I think there's always going to be a certain smugness on the part of some musicians who've worked these rhythms out purely by feel. But I don't think what Richard Spaven said there is the whole truth. And I think we can get a lot closer to the genuine feel of some of these rhythms than people sometimes think. For starters, those ratios on Lin's drum machines made people realise that there was a more calculated approach to recreating these rhythms. The 60% swing is a ratio of 3 to 2, so it can be recreated using a quintuplet. Depending on the speed, it is possible to think of fast subdivisions of 3 and 2 to help catch the feel. Videos on how to play quintuplet grooves are all over YouTube, so it's clearly a popular approach. Another one is the ratio of 4 to 3, or a septuplet groove. This is the equivalent to about 57% swung. Feel is also the approach for many when it comes to note shifting. As we saw, many of the ways the snare drums were shifted were the tiniest of fractions, so thinking of it in terms of notation or calculation is pretty tricky. There is however one trick that makes it a little easier, bouncing the shifted note off another one. Yes, love! Here's Anderson Pack in his Tiny Desk concert. Yes, Lord! The hi-hat here is straight, but the snare is bounced into it a little early. If I was notating this, I would probably put the snare as a grace note to the hi-hat. It's just unusual because the grace note is louder and more important than the main note. Flam is a drummer's term for a grace note that runs into the main note. And I've sometimes heard this way of playing as an inverted flam, because it's the main note that comes first, followed by the weaker note that arrives on the beat. Now, in researching this video, I fell a little bit in love with the band Hiatus Coyote. And in this track, Swamp Thing, from the album Choose Your Weapon, the extreme wonkiness in a live setting is something I find quite exhilarating. Drummer Perrin Moss here shows off a kind of double inverted flam. There's a quintuplet swing to start with, but the downbeat itself is an unaccented hi-hat. Running into that is another unaccented hi-hat, and only before that, the loud booming bass drum, which of course feels like the real downbeat. So there's a double wonkiness from the combination of quintuplet swing and essentially a double shifted downbeat. And the real intention of this is hammered home by the bassist Paul Bender, who somehow manages to sync up his playing with those wonky drum downbeats. I think he's using a similar technique of playing a less important, quieter note on the actual downbeat. Something that feels as uneven and wonky and exotic as this is really where I'd love to get as a classical composer. If you're wondering why I'm spending so much time dwelling on these wonky rhythms, I think it's because I find they're engaging in equal measure on a physical and an intellectual level. A really groovy wonky rhythm like this one is impossible not to move to, but my brain also finds it really interesting trying to unpick what's actually happening. But what about those unique Dilla grooves where several parts operate in different kinds of subdivision? That's surely impossible live, right? Well no, but it often involves some kind of almost mystical level of understanding between the players to really pull it off. Rob Malarkey here shows off how he's able to play an entire bass line massively shifted away from the drum grid. So back. It took a lot of work to get that consistentness. Yes. I think I can move it by varying amounts. Malaki's ability to do that seems to be a skill he's acquired over many years. I'm not sure how many people would be comfortable playing like this, but it's clearly something that is possible. Or check out this clip from the amazing Dommy and JD Beck. Dommy here is playing very straight on the keys where Beck is using something like a quintuplet groove. It's quite disorientating. And almost the most impressive rhythmic achievement here is Dommy's ability to keep dead straight despite what's happening in the drums. I don't really want to use this word, but the pair just have a remarkable rhythmic synergy that must have been cultivated over years. 
Here's another example where they're sort of time shifted from one another in a very Diller-esque style. So finally, I want to turn to my own music and show you my attempts to explore some of these ideas within classical music. My first attempt at a shifted beat came in around 2006, when I was trying to write some folk music inspired songs. A friend had introduced me to some Romanian folk music, and one singer who was a sort of cafe crooner from the 1950s was unlike anything I'd ever heard before. His name was Dona Dimitri Siminica. Apart from the incredibly haunting vocal performance, that accompanying rhythm on one of my favourite instruments, the cymbalan, had the same kind of beat shift that you hear in a Dilla track. This time it was the third beat that was shifted early. So I wanted to try and steal that rhythm for my own piece, but using music notation, how could I do it? The basic version would look something like this. But of course that would miss out the early shifted third beat. But finding a way to notate this kind of thing successfully is really not so easy. It's as much a game of player psychology as anything else. You could write it as a small tuplet tied to the main note, something like this. Or the same but as an unmeasured grace note. The risk with both of these, I felt, was you'd be in danger of the player sort of lurching to catch the early beat, so it wouldn't have the sort of naturally lazy feel that the original does. In the end, my approach when I tried to recreate this rhythm in my own piece was simply to add a little note saying, play the third beat a fraction early. It seemed to work okay, but it's a perfect little example of the challenge of getting this kind of rhythm down in notation form. A few years later I attempted a more adventurous Diller-esque idea to shift an entire passage by a micro amount in my opera The Firework Maker's Daughter. The music had a steady 16th note pulse in the harp and I wanted this quarter note pattern on the glockenspiel but to delay it just slightly throughout. I knew it would be pretty much impossible using traditional approaches to find a way to notate this so that it could be played back. So a bit like in that Anderson Pack example where the early snare uses the less important hi-hat as a sort of anchor, I asked the percussionist to play a silent hit on the beat every quarter note by hitting something that didn't make any noise like a bit of tablecloth and then play the actual sounding note on the glockenspiel just after that. I think my most Diller inspired passage was an attempt to use effectively two kinds of subdivision at once, which I did in my recent piece Luli Loops. Check out my video on Vaporwave in classical music if you want to hear more about that piece. I wanted to effectively use a quintuplet and septuplet swing simultaneously. The upper part has this septuplet pattern and I asked Richard Groblewski from the Zurich Chamber Orchestra who were performing the piece to demonstrate it for me. Against this seven I had the cellos play this quintuplet pattern. And here's the two in combination. So you can see it's definitely possible, but it's also something that's quite outside the normal rhythmic experience of a classical player. For it to become as natural as those hip-hop drummers, it would require just as much long-term repetition, I suspect. 
In hip hop it also works well because the wonky beat is literally repeated throughout the whole piece, which might be less likely in a classical piece. I'd like to try and write a piece where this kind of groove, maybe with some grid shifts added in, was a central feature of the piece. The challenge for the classical world is that it takes time to really nail the feel of these rhythms, and in most cases for contemporary music, time is the most scarce of resources. If you only have one hour of rehearsal, you're not going to have time to get into the feel of a groove. The one place I could imagine seeing it work would be in chamber music. String quartets, for example, often go to extraordinary lengths to master a challenging modern score. So given the incentive of a really good piece that uses these Diller-esque rhythms, I don't think the challenge would be beyond them. And that's certainly a day that I look forward to. I'm guessing for some of you the whole idea of mixing Diller with classical music might seem strange, but I don't think Diller himself would agree with you. He actually learnt the cello from a young age, and he sampled many classical composers throughout his career, including J.S. Bach and Eric Satie. In the end it comes back to what I was saying at the start. One of the most creative things you can do is take something and put it in a context it was never designed for. The result will certainly be unexpected, and it might just be the next big thing. As always, thanks to my patrons on Patreon for supporting the channel. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.